Welcome on behalf of uh, Medscape Neurology. We will be talking today about highlights from the International Meeting of the Movement Disorder Society. I'm uh, Catherine Lefebvre. I'm a movement specialist here in Saratoga Springs, New York. And I will be talking with Dr. Indira Submaranian, who is a clinical professor at UCLA and director of the VA Center in LA as well. One of the most commonly asked questions when patients come to a visit is what's new, right? What, what, what's new for Parkinson's disease? And, you know, I was talking about a colleague last, uh, with a colleague last week who also attended a meeting and uh, she boiled it down to the message, carbidopa levodopa is still our best best medication. <laughs> so with that as a preface, why don't you fill us in a little bit what, what caught your eye and, and, and as far as the scientific updates in the meeting? Yeah, so we had um, a real host of abstracts. I mean, first of all, just to go back to the meeting itself, there were a couple of really interesting lectures. And if people can watch them later, I think one is, um, you know, Professor Batia won an award um, and his talk was around, you know, phenomenology and, you know, how important, um, you know, understanding movements and looking at a patient and, and analyzing movement and sort of getting back to the basics of the physical exam. So that was something that was exciting. And then Professor Lees showed some beautiful videos about, you know, the history of um, encephalitis lethargica to kind of put our context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I think those are two hot lectures. And, and I think both of them are really about getting back to basics of not just relying on tests and um, you know digital technology, but really seeing the patient in front of you and, and, and sort of the art of that patient interaction. So I, I, I think that's a shout out to that approach. Um, so in terms of, uh, yeah, there, I think that the sense that Cinemet is still, or Carbidopa, Levodopa, Matopar, depending on where you live um, in the world, um, is still at oldie buddy goodie there was an abstract that came out of the toronto group that was talking about um dbs so deep brain surgery and the time to getting deep brain surgery did not seem to be different uh if you were started on a dopamine agonist or if you started on levodopa so i think an, another piece of information to sort of make us feel a little bit more comfortable with using levodopa i think there was a sense that we should be sparing levodopa using agonists instead and i think you know many of us who've seen the side effect profiles of agonists including things like um the uh, uh sort of um impulse control issues, um, sleepiness sometimes, you know, various other um, cognitive side effects like hallucinations. Um, the pendulum, I think, is is still in the sort of court of using levodopa. And certainly even in this, you know, lifestyle approach sort of uh, strategies, I think we still think that levodopa is an important drug to replace dopamine um, and is important in, in sort of the, the total prescription of, of approaching a patient. So we're, we're not talking about using exercise or diet instead of a medication. It's really about sort of this integrated approach to using both. So I think that was an interesting um, abstract. Uh, another abstract that was interesting um, is that uh, from Mayela um, uh, Violente and her group in Mexico, um, they looked at um, a number of patients uh, with um, Parkinson's disease and the effects of um, the COVID vaccines um, on uh, motor and non-motor symptoms, and there did not seem to be a negative impact on symptoms. So I think we can say, and I think many of us have believed this, that you know we can safely give these vaccines to Parkinson's patients without worsening and that the benefits of getting vaccinated outweigh sort of the risk of worsening, you know, function. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad I did that because I know many patients have been concerned about the vaccines and possibly worsening their symptoms, but I think that's that's good to know. Yeah, I think you also had uh, mentioned there was some new um, data on uh, digital monitoring, biosensors, markers. You want to speak towards um, updates in that realm? Yes, I mean, I think there's, you know, with the pandemic, um, there was sort of this shift to telehealth and then the sort of sense that we can use various sorts of modalities to monitor patients. And there's more and more and more ways to sort of gather data um, on our patients. And our patients are actually quite interested also in learning about how these, um, you know, their minute by minute or or day to day sort of variations um, can be tracked for themselves for self management. So I think, you know, um, there was a number of abstracts on this sort of um, technologies. And I think, you know, there has been again, um, some controversies on whether this is a useful thing. Um, I was at a non motor um, meeting uh, 
Professor Chowdhury and his team had put on a meeting um, of this sort in London, and I got to present on our wellness uh, task force there. And there was actually um, a couple of debates, and one of them was whether digital technology should is useful or not. And I think that you know, um, taken with a grain of salt, many of this data can be useful um, overall to globally understand, um, you know, sort of uh, the day-to-day -day things that patients have. Um, one of the abstracts that I had highlighted was looking at, um, you know, sort of how much sleep patients with Parkinson's get and how many steps they're getting compared to controls um, that were age matched. And so I think it gives you some sense of how to guide patients, but I think it is still very, very important um, to, you know, connect with the patients. And the patients don't like it when all we do is gather data and then put data into a database and fill out electronic health records. I think many patients feel like um, they want uh, doctors that listen and hear them and are there for them. And, you know, that sort of, um, in-person touch or, you know, the, the connection, I think we will never be replaced with just monitoring, but I think it's additional information. Um, what's your sense of that, Catherine? I, I don't know how much you're using this or, or are you excited about, you know, the advent of when we can print out, you know, um, large amounts of data on our patients from the week of monitoring before they come in to see us? Yeah, I think I agree with you. I mean, I think it's important to not kind of lose the, you know, forest and the trees, so to speak. And uh, it also depends on on patient types, you know, and personalities and how technology, you know, there's I think some people who really like um, doing these type of things and really getting some more objective data on their sleep. But um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I don't think it's necessarily needed to kind of monitor people all the time. It might be very helpful to, especially uh, then it's a little bit difficult to figure out you know, when patients have, you know, just a, a little bit, uh, it's hard to know, are they in off states? Are they actually having side effects from medications? So I think there's a lot of situations where getting more data is, is you know, helpful. So, um, yeah, so you kind of mentioned in, in that paper, they kind of, um, I think, captured sort of a week in a life of Parkinson's. So, so what was your kind of takeaway or maybe any, any messages from that or? I noticed that the patient with Parkinson's did not sleep very much, but the other people seem to sleep pretty well. <laughs> I was envious of the control person having just come back from being sleep deprived uh, from all the jet lag and everything and multiple meetings when we've hit the ground. But I think the control average was like 10 hours of sleep. I was like, who is this person? I want to meet them. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, it is helpful. And one thing that you and I have talked about before, Catherine, is, you know, for example, the effects of the menstrual cycle on motor symptoms and sort of tracking possibly, um, you know, if you can get the period and, and sort of these ups and downs and then get a sense of the non-motor and motor, we haven't really looked at that before. And so I think these apps, um, as I, I had just gone to something and read something about migraine, uh, you know, physicians are learning these sorts of things and then actually able to embed lifestyle choices in the apps as reminders. You know, you didn't sleep very well last night, try to get sleep better today. You didn't eat right yesterday. You know, let's try to, you know, build in more, um, you know, set uh, meal times or hydration or, you know, they can track things that may be helpful for um, reinforcing some of these wellness prescriptions as well. So, so, I mean, That's a great point. Yeah. So definitely some, definitely some potential. Yeah. Well, I wanted to mention one abstract that caught my eye and, uh, and that was actually something that was also published recently as a brief report in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the article is entitled Implanted System for Orthostatic Hypotension and Multiple System Atrophy. Now, as you know, orthostatic hypotension can also be a very frustrating non-motor symptom um, in Parkinson's disease, as well as the um, atypical Parkinsonian syndrome, such as MSA. And so that's a very interesting proof of concept study. So um, I think many of uh, listeners have probably heard that spinal cord stimulation has been uh, very uh, successfully um, uh, tested by several groups um, around the world now for spinal cord injuries. And uh, people have actually been able to regain some motor function as well as autonomic uh, dysfunction uh, or so uh, correct autonomic dysfunction. So very interesting. And um, this group from Lausanne, Switzerland uh, did um, a thoracic spinal cord stimulation in a patient with severe orthostatic hypotension who was essentially bedridden. And uh, along the spinal cord stimulation along with some physical therapy allowed her to be ambulatory again, which is um, amazing. So 
you know, this is um, really kind of uh, early stages of this type of research, but it's, uh, you know, exciting to see how uh, technological advances along those lines might be um, helpful for some of our patients who struggle with this particular aspect. Uh, so I wanted to mention that and we can kind of link those abstracts in the, in the show notes uh, for anyone who wants to uh, dig in a little bit deeper. Yeah, that sounds really cool, actually. But yeah, it's an end of one, I guess. So we'll, we'll have to. Yeah, see. <laughs> yeah, proof, proof of concept, proof of concept. But it's uh, it, it's been sort of a hot topic in uh, spinal cord injury for sure. So more to come. Yeah. Well, I think um, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, it was great to talk to you, and you know, your enthusiasm is, is definitely uh, speaking for itself. I think it's uh, definitely very exciting, uh, as you said, you know, to really uh, go in a little bit new avenues and and uh, really emphasize. Size, um, the control that many of our patients can have over their symptom control and um, focusing on uh, things that have traditionally not been emphasized maybe enough, uh, such as social connectedness, exercise, and so on. Thanks everyone for listening. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, the virtual um, uh, uh, kind of access to some of the lectures will be available soon as well for those who attend it. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of your day.